by? <laughs> so this is what y'all do at the upper school. <laughs> I am very humble uh, to have shaken hands and had a conversation with these presenters today, including the musicians. Y'all blow me away. Can we dim the lights a little? I, I like to be hugged by darkness. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. There is a belief that I have that if you wish to live a sane, healthy life on earth, you need to be intimately connected to wilderness. And I like the poet Gary Snyder's definition of that term. He defines wilderness as a diversity of living and non-living beings flourishing according to their own sorts of order. It is that diversity of opinion that is so necessary here, for as the scientist Jacob Ranowski put it, there is no absolute knowledge. All information is imperfect. We have to treat it with humility. So in the absence of final knowledge, does it not make sense to gather as many opinions as possible as you're trying to assemble your understanding of how the world works and how best to exist in that world? So the question becomes how best to plug into that flow of opinionated conversation that is to be found in wilderness. I have attempted this in the guise and manner of a natural historian. And fortunately, I've had some wonderful instructors along the way, including that group of animals that we call snakes, that early on in my life taught me that very powerful lesson of how to overcome my fear of difference in the world, of those things that do not look and act like me. And then, of course, there were classroom teachers such as Dr. John Harrington, that geology professor that was always urging his students to go out into the wilder places. And then he tacked on that warning that once there, you had better expect the unexpected. It was Dr. Harrington that introduced me to the trickster element in nature. And so guided by these kinds of teachings, I've gone out over the years into some of the wildest places that I could reach, and I've had some, I've had some phenomenal experiences. But time and again, on returning from these journeys, I had to admit to myself that I did not spiritually feel a part of that world out there. It's kind of like that sensation you have when you go to the zoo and you so want to climb over and get in closer contact with those other life forms, but you always encounter some barrier that blocks the attempt. And this frust frustration stayed with me for some time until I took a teaching position at an independent school. That first year, the headmaster invited a friend of his to come and present to the fifth grade class. And I was fortunate to be able to join him. All I heard about this guy before meeting him was that he had his own school and that he employed Native American skills as teaching tools. And when he arrived, he did the two things that I think you have to do if you're going to teach a human being anything. He gave us something to do with our hands and he told us a really good story. He asked us to pick up sticks of a certain size range to put them in a given spot and then sit around them in a circle. I don't think any of us particularly were excited about sticks, but we were polite, we did what he requested, and we, after we were seated, he started telling us this powerful native story about the origin of fire. And as he started telling the story, he took those sticks that we had gathered, and he arranged them into a, a little teepee-shaped structure with an opening on one side. And when that was completed, he reached over to a bag that he had brought with him and he took out two sticks and a wad of shredded bark. He put the bark on the ground. He took one of the sticks, it was a flat, short little stick with a notch in its side and a little indented place near the notch. He put that on top of the bark, held it in place with his foot as he reached over to the other stick, which was a little slender dowel. He put one end of the dowel in that little indented place on the first stick, held it upright between his palms, 
and started twisting it back and forth as he continued telling the story. And while we watched and listened, all of a sudden I noticed a little trail of smoke rising up from the meeting place between those two sticks. And at that moment, he had completely captured my attention and my imagination. When the story ended, he put down the dial, he carefully removed the little notch stick beneath, and there, resting on that little pile of wood dust, excuse me, that little pile of bark, and, and, a, and a bit of wood dust was a red hot glowing ember. He paused for a moment and then he picks up the bark, gently, calm, carefully folds it around the ember and holds it up above his head. It was a breezy day and as the wind came pouring through that bundle, smoke came flowing out of it and then all of a sudden, phew, this flame leaps up. And he then very calmly holding this burning bark places it into the doorway, which happens to be on the windward side of that little stick house, and the next thing we know, we're sitting around this crackling fire. But it's not just any fire, because the context of the story had made this a very special fire. This was the mother of all fires. And then he did a marvelous thing. Without saying another word, he got up and he walked away. But he left behind him on the ground those two sticks that he had earlier used to call out the fire. I quickly looked into the eyes of the students around me and I thought I saw in some of their eyes the idea forming that I already had in my mind. So I leapt forward and I grabbed those sticks. I may have shoved a student or two out of the way. It's all very vague. For the next week, maybe week and a half, Listen to this carefully. Some of those students came to school early. I'm going to repeat that. They came to school early. They found their way to my room. And together we rubbed some of the most horrible bleeding blisters on our hands. Trying to do what the visitor, we speak his name in hushed tones, the visitor had shown us could be done. I have not looked at a stick the same way since then. The following summer, I found myself in a teacher workshop offered by the local Institute of Archaeology. At the end of the two or three week program, a visiting instructor came to present to us on the topic of the beginnings of human technology. I was blown away by the story and after it was over, I went up and in a conversation with the presenter, I found out that he was employed by a natural history museum that offered classes, affordable classes, to adults on the topic of, and I want you to steal your nerves before I say this term because it startles some people, on the topic of primitive technology. The word primitive here means first. For the last 25 years, I have taken every one of those classes that I can possibly get into. Because what I've discovered it is, is that it is these primitive technologies that most enable me to plug into that flow of opinion to be found in wilderness. The, most, the, the critical difference that these first skills have made in my approach as a natural historian is that now I go out into nature not just as an observer but as a user of that world. And I, this sounds harsh, to use nature but isn't that what we all do in our daily lives? The difference here is that the middlemen have been removed, placing me in direct contact with the source, and it is powerful. These first skills allow me to transform a natural object into a natural resource that I can turn to in time of need. And this gathering process raises profound philosophical questions relating to conservation. For instance, what gives us the right to take? How do we ask permission? How do we express our gratitude? And I raise these inquiries in the form of conversations that I have with the living and non-living beings that I meet out there. Now you might be wondering, how do you have a conversation, a two-way chat with a non-living being? Let me give you an example. You pick up a stone, 
and you try to transform that stone into a thin, fine edge projectile point, an outhead. As soon as you start the process, the conversation, that rock begins to tell you what that rock will and will not do. And you, if you are sufficiently observant, begin to understand something of the nature of that individual piece of stone. It's this laying on of the hands coupled with an open intellect that is so vital. We humans think of ourselves as visual creatures, seeing is believing. But what I've come to understand is that it is through our hands, by fondling the earth, that we most truly develop a meaningful relationship with her. Let me remind you that we are the only creature on the planet that can take the thumb and precisely place it to the tip of the adjacent fingers. This ability gives us a wide range of power and precision grips for the grasping of a wide, a great variety of tools. And isn't this what technology is all about? A tool user using a tool. And a tool is anything that aids in the accomplishment of a task. A stone flake, a piece of grass, a spoken word, these all fall into the category of tools. And to be a tool does not require the use of what I call electricery. <laughs> As I learned, this is the first digital technology. <laughs> now, you too can become a primitive like me. You already have the basic toolkit built in. Why not learn to use those tools and begin to get on speaking terms with the earth? For far too long, we humans have disinherited ourselves from the other living and non-living beings that comprise and share our world. And in closing, I simply want to say that this public service announcement has been brought to you by the manufacturer of sticks and stones. <laughs> <laughs>